Hello to chapter 103 of Moby Dick by Herman Melville. And this chapter is titled Measurement of the Whale's Skeleton. In the first place, I wish to lay before you a particular plain statement touching the living bulk of this leviathan whose skeleton we are briefly to exhibit. Such a statement may prove useful here. According to a careful calculation I have made and which I partly base upon Captain Scoresby's estimate of 70 tons for the largest sized Greenland whale of 60 feet in length, According to my careful calculation, I say a sperm whale of the largest magnitude between 85 and 90 feet in length and something less than 40 feet in its fullest circumference, such a whale will weigh at least 90 tons, so that, reckoning 13 men to a ton, he would considerably outweigh the combined population of a whole village of 1,100 inhabitants. Think you not, then, that brains like yoked cattle should be put to this leviathan to make him at all budge to any landsman's imagination? Having already, in various ways, put before you his skull, spout hole, jaw, teeth, tail, forehead, fins and diverse other parts, I shall now simply point out what is most interesting in the general bulk of his unobstructed bones. But as the colossal skull embraces so very large a proportion of the entire extent of the skeleton, as it is by far the most complicated part, and as nothing is to be repeated concerning it in this chapter, you must not fail to carry it in your mind or under your arm as we proceed, otherwise you will not gain a complete notion of the general structure we are about to view. In length, the sperm whale's skeleton at trank measured 72 feet, so that when fully invested and extended in life, he must have been 90 feet long, for in the whale the skeleton loses about one-fifth in length compared with the living body. Of this 72 feet, his skull and jaw comprised some 20 feet, leaving some 50 feet of plain backbone. Attached to this backbone for something less than a third of its length, was the mighty circular basket of ribs which once enclosed his vitals. To me, this vast ivory-ribbed chest with the long unrelieved spine extending far away from it in a straight line not a little resembled the hull of a great ship new laid upon the stocks when only some twenty of her naked bow ribs are inserted and the keel is otherwise, for the time, but a long, disconnected timber. The ribs were ten on a side. The first, to begin from the neck, was nearly six feet long. The second, third and fourth were each successively longer till you came to the climax of the fifth, or one of the middle ribs, which measured eight feet and some inches. From that part, the remaining ribs diminished till the tenth and last only spanned five feet and some inches in general thickness. They all bore a seemly correspondence to their length. The middle ribs were the most arched. In some of the arsa sides, they are used for beams whereon to lay footpath bridges over small streams. In considering these ribs, I could not but be struck anew with the circumstance so variously repeated in this book that the skeleton of the whale is by no means the mould of his invested form. The largest of the trank ribs, one of the middle ones, occupied that part of the fish which, in life, is greatest in depth. Now, the greatest depth of the invested body of this particular whale must have been at least 
16 feet, whereas the corresponding rib measured but little more than 8 feet, so that this rib only conveyed half of the true notion of the living magnitude of that part. Besides, for some way where I now saw but the naked spine, all that had been once wrapped round with tons of added bulk in flesh, muscle, blood, and bowels. Still more, for the ample fins, I here saw but a few distorted I here saw but a few disordered joints, and in place of the weighty and majestic but boneless flukes, an utter blank. How vain and foolish, then, thought I, for timid, untravelled man to try to comprehend aright this wondrous whale by merely poring over his head, attenuated skeleton, stretched in this peaceful wood. No, only in the heart of quickest perils, only when within the eddyings of his angry flukes, only on the profound unbounded sea can the fully invested whale be truly and livingly found out. But the spine, for that, the best way we can consider it is with a crane to pile its bones high up on end, no speedy enterprise. But now, it's done. It looks much like Pompeii's pillar. There are forty and odd vertebrae in all, which in the skeleton are not locked together. They mostly lie like the great knobbed blocks on a gothic spire, forming solid courses of heavy masonry. The largest, a middle one, is in width something less than three feet and in depth more than four. The smallest, where the spine tapers away into the tail, is only two inches in width and looks something like a white billiard ball. I was told that there were still smaller ones, but they had been lost by some little cannibal urchins, the priest's children, who had stolen them to play marbles with. Thus, we see how that the spine of even the hugest of living things tapers off at last into simple child's play. So that was chapter 103. Bye-bye. Till next time with chapter 104 titled The Fossil Whale.